Thank you, Brother Gene, for that powerful word of the working of God. It's a, a delight to be with all you brethren again. I'd like to thank you for all your prayers for our travels and, uh, and our trip out here. We know that, that it's the Lord that's brought us together, so we would like to acknowledge that it's, that it's him who's done this. He's kept us. He's kept us in the faith. We're all still believing, so that's we're on the right road, brethren. Been assigned the. Uh, it's quite a. It's a monumental task, actually, to, to to think about, and expound the ability of God. This is this is something that's gonna. It's gonna be exceedingly abundantly, above all you can ask or think or imagine. We're this is a. This is, as David would say, an exceedingly large room. So I, I feel I'm constrained within myself. I can only speak about these things that, concerning the ability of God. I can only speak about those things which I've seen and those things which I've heard. I can only speak as the spirit of faith has moved me. I can only speak on those things which I believe. So those things, I, uh, I pray, brethren, that you'll be able to receive them in faith as well. Because I know that that is a work of God, too, to receive the word engrafted, which is able to save your souls. <clears throat> Isaiah 46 and verse 9. Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is none else. <clears throat> I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from the ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. The Lord, here's my message, brethren, the Lord has the power, the wisdom, the resources, the strength, the authority, and the liberty to do all his pleasure. There's, there's nothing that is constraining our God from doing everything that he wants to do. He's able to do all his pleasure. <clears throat> That means that God is doing what he wants to do. We've got to be able to see that. We can't, get, we can't get much farther if we can't see that God is doing what he wants to do. God is not going around to men and taking a poll on what they want to do. That is not what he's doing. He, you can come up with all kinds of ideas about what you might want God to do, but he's going to do what he wants to do. My suggestion is to figure out what that is and get involved. God is able to do all his pleasure. And the ability of God is not, is not defined by what men are able to do. Just as when God purposed, he didn't look at men, what men would do, he purposed within himself. God's ability is in the same, this is the same way, his his ability is not constrained or bordered or outlined by the ability of men, but by his own nature. <clears throat> God's ability is constrained by his own nature. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. Whatever God does is righteous because he himself is righteous. God cannot do anything that's unrighteous. He's not going to do it. He cannot do it. He's not able to do it. God's oh, he only doeth righteousness. I love it. <clears throat> Calling a ravenous bird from the east, the man that executeth my counsel from a far country. Yea, I have spoken it, I will also bring it to pass. I have purposed it, I will also do it. Hearken unto me, you, you sloth-hearted that are far off from righteousness. I bring, my, I bring near my righteousness. It shall not be afar off. And my salvation shall not tarry, and I will place salvation in Zion for Israel my glory. Praise God that he is bringing righteousness near and placing salvation in Zion. That's near enough for you to attain it. That's, you can get it. You can, you can have the very righteousness of God. That's what he's pleased to do. That's what he said. I will do all my pleasure, and this is what I'm going to do. I'm going I'm to bring my righteousness near and save, and save men. So when a person cries out to God for deliverance from sin, it's his pleasure to respond and save a soul like that. P. 
people are not saved. Men are not saved because they've twisted God's arm in a way or, or coerced him in a way to do something that he didn't want to do. God is saving men because he takes pleasure in it. And I'm, I'm thank, I take pleasure in it too. <clears throat> they have appealed to the loving kindness of God and the Lord has brought righteousness near and placed salvation in Zion. So <clears throat> I'd like to first, I'd like to consider how men are, are unable. They're unable. They're utterly unable to do the things that God does. Now, men have been able to do some things while upon the earth. Um, they've been able to build towers. We've, we're, we're dwelling in a city right here. They've been able to build cities. Men have made ships. They've made planes, trains, and automobiles. You could go on with a long list of things. Yet we know that the first tower that was ever constructed fell and was confounded. <clears throat> and many and eventually all cities will become desolate. Ships eventually sink. Planes, trains, and automobiles, they crash, derail, and they're broken down. There's junkyards full of them. The ability, the ability of men, however great you may think it is, it's only temporary. God is the one who works in the eternal things. Has a man ever added a minute to his day? Has a man ever taken away his sin? Has a man ever made himself righteous? Has any man ever given himself eternal life? Has any man been able to subdue all things to himself? Has any man ever come to the knowledge of God? <clears throat> if you were to do like some holy mathematics and you were to just take all the wisdom that the world has ever produced throughout all of history and add it all together, the sum total of that is going to be foolishness. It's, just, it's all just foolishness. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not get God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For that, after that, in the wisdom of God, the world, by wisdom, knew not God. That's the definition of foolishness. Somebody who does not know God. The world... The wisdom of the world is foolishness because men are not able to attain the wisdom and knowledge of God. And no one has ever been able to obtain eternal life. Which, that's what the knowledge of God is. This isn't, no, isn't eternal life knowing God? Men have not been able to get, you're not able to get it on your own. For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. God is able to accomplish what is utterly impossible with men and do so by means that the world deems as foolishness. God is actually saving people who believe. He's saving believing people by showing them what he has accomplished and will accomplish. God is saving men by revealing Christ in the gospel. <clears throat> and of course, the God of heaven is the only God who is able. Of course, that's because all other gods are no gods at all. All other gods, they are known for what they require of men. Be it routine or ritual, ritual or prayer or offering... False gods are known for their requirements of false piety. That's all that they are. Just do some stuff. Do a bunch of stuff. It's all going to, it doesn't matter anyway. <clears throat> Such requirements do not change the heart. They do not change, the, they do not save the soul, and they cannot deliver from the pit of sin and death. The one true God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who gives life and breath to all things, is known for what he can do for man. He's known for what God, God is known for what he is able to do. Amen. False gods are known for what they require of you. <clears throat> All idols are not able, every one of them. There has never been an idol who's said to be able. Every, every, one, every idol is unable. They do not have the power or resources. They're dead images made by the hands of men. That's all that they are. Whether they be 
Christian gods or Buddhist gods or any other kind of god, they're all, it's all just dead. They're not able to change. The prophets of Baal are still calling upon the name of their gods to bring down fire from heaven, saying, we have the program to change your life. We can make you rich. Our God wants to give you whatever you want. Just give us your money and your time and your soul. That's what they require. <clears throat> There's still neither voice, not any to answer, nor any that regard to answer such calls as these. There's nobody. That, all, all other gods are enabled, brethren. <clears throat> now, God is able. That's the message. God is able. <clears throat> and he is he works things that only he can do. The exclusive ability of God, if you will. God does not envy the ability of another. Frankly, he's not really that impressed with what others can do. He just he's he's not impressed at all. <clears throat> because everything that God is doing men are incapable of doing. So to be saved, you might be called to go through the eye of a needle, maybe. And you can either say, well, th this, this is impossible. Who then can be saved? Or you can say, well, with God, all things are possible. Amen. God's still delivering people through the eye of a needle. That's just, that's what he's doing. Amen. He's still taking people up out of the pit. That's what he's doing. You can't deliver yourself out of there. God can pull you up, though. Amen. His arm's not too short. Amen. God will not involve himself in tasks that men can accomplish on their own. And this, therefore, makes boasting completely excluded. Nobody can boast before God because he's the only one that's able to do what he's able to do. And it also makes giving God glory completely reasonable because he's the only one that can do uh, that which he's working. Now, it's, it's most dangerous to reason <clears throat> upon the ability of God with the natural mind. Statements such as, God cannot do this, or God will not do that, or God doesn't do that anymore, are actually quite, quite popular, yet they should be said with the very highest degree of caution. That's a road that you, didn't, you, you don't want to frequently travel down. I, I would exhort you to stay upon the road of the ability of God and, and, and try to stay far away from that road. <clears throat> now God, it is only God who can do things that no man can do. Uh, God does not have any, have any trouble doing things that are impossible with men. All, th all things are possible with God. For example, God is the only one he can bring forth life out of a barren womb. He's, he's made example of this multiple times. He, God's rebuttal to Sarah when she laughed within herself. She laughed within herself. Let's just get that straight. She laughed within herself because by faith she was strengthened also. So Sarah laughed within herself. God's rebuttal to her is, is there anything too hard for the Lord? Like, that's an open-ended question. Like, no, there's not. And then he said through Jeremiah, Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? See, God possesses the skill, power, wisdom, strength, authority, and liberty to do all he pleases. Amen. That's what ability is. All that you've got to have all that in order to be able. You can't have just the power, wisdom, no strength, and no authority. It doesn't work. God, you got to have it all, and God has it all. Amen. God has the ability to fulfill all His promises, regardless of what the enemy thinks or desires. God is over all things. God is the only one who can tell the opposition what He's going to do ahead of time. And then bring it to pass, whether they like it or not, and even as it's been declared, even involve their will and the purpose to the working out of his eternal purpose. <clears throat> it's God who shall change our vile body that it might be fashioned like unto his glorious body, 
according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. God is able to subdue all all things unto himself. Now, have you ever, have you found yourself with affections or thoughts that rise up against the knowledge of God? Things that maybe might be even associated with the vile body that you're possessing. The, the good news is, is that these things which you might come up as a thought or a desire or a lust, God has not necessarily promised you deliverance from the existence of such things, but he has promised grace to endure such things. He's able to subdue all things, even affections for this world. He's able to subdue all things unto himself. So if you have an affection that you, that you, that rises up against God, he's able to subdue it. Our objective, (laughs) our our warfare is indirect, you know. Our objective is not to subdue enemies. God God is subduing enemies. He's the one that's doing the subduing. Um, Our our objective is to abide in the Savior. And he subdues enemies. He's the one that makes his enemies his footstool. He's making his foes a resting place for his toes, if you will. You know, if you can... I like to think about... I mean, he just does what he wants. He just takes his enemies and makes them a resting place. That's, that sounds like something that Christ can do. <clears throat> now, God is fully able in Christ Jesus. This is where the gospel, enter in the gospel. This is what God is fully able in Christ. <clears throat> the ability of God is not connected to learning or training as with men, but is connected with his nature and purpose. God doesn't have to, he doesn't really go do a bunch of bunch, bench presses and squats to go be able. He's, he is able. God is able. It's connected with his very own nature and purpose. <clears throat> and seeing that God has not and will not change, and the purpose of God has not and will not change because it is an eternal purpose, which he's purposed in himself, therefore God's ability technically hasn't changed. God has always been able to do all his pleasure. As it said, thou art, for my God is the king of old, working salvation in the midst of the earth. God has always been working salvation in the midst of the earth. So when we read in Genesis, God was working salvation at the midst of the earth. If we're reading about Noah, we're we're thinking about God working salvation in the midst of the earth. Abraham, Moses, Isaiah, Micah, that he's working salvation in the midst of the earth. However, because of sin and iniquity and the transgression of man, God was not fully able to work in man as he desires. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither his ear heavy that it cannot hear, but, but your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. Sin is anything but innocent. It is, it is anything but innocent. <clears throat> Sin not only affects you in separation from God, it actually, if you can receive it, it affects God because he is not able to work that which he fully desires in men. <clears throat> Sin so affected God that he was restrained from fully working in men as he desired to do. <clears throat> Sin and the separation caused by sin permitted God, because of his righteous nature, to do what he fully desired to do, to save men to the uttermost. Seeing then that no man can deliver himself from his own sin, much less the sin of another, and all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, that leaves men in quite a predicament. This is quite a serious situation. Because of sin, God can really only do one of two things with the human race. He can destroy everyone that sins and wipe out the whole race. And he would, be, he, he could, he would have been righteous doing that. He's done it before, and it was righteous then. Um, or the second and much more difficult and infinitely more involved 
would be to take sin away and make men righteous through the work of a Savior. That, that's, that's the involvement of Jesus Christ. All the scriptures were declaring that men and God needed a deliverer from sin. And he saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no intercessor. Therefore his arm brought salvation unto him and his righteousness it sustained him. Now the foot is used for smashing down, but the arm is used for obtaining and bringing up. God sent his arm and not his foot. I am thankful that the Lord has brought us up. <clears throat> Praise God that he sent his arm into the world and worked salvation. And when John was out baptizing beyond Jordan, he seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold! the Lamb of God, which take away the sin of the world. And it was a glorious and happy day when I saw the Lamb of God coming to take away my sin. What a precious day that was. <clears throat> now Christ Jesus has manifested the ability of God. He's the expressed image of his person. <clears throat> God is able to actually forgive sin and take it away in Jesus Christ. Amen. It, he's able to do it. That's, that's the declaration that we have, that there, that there is forgiveness of sins. And now in Christ Jesus, God is able to work all things concerning redemption and transformation. The working of God prior to Christ entering into the world, prior to the word being made flesh, it was like a pointer that would just point all men to the, to the Savior to come. Pointing to the fact that men needed a Savior. And now that the Savior has come and sin and death have been put away, righteousness and life have come shining forth. And in Jesus Christ... There's not anything that God wants to do that he's not able to do. He's able to do all his pleasure. He's able to do all things in Christ that he was not able to do before because of sin. Specifically, the work of redemption and transformation. Things like giving people a new heart. Putting the law of God on their mind and writing it on their hearts. Having a people that would actually hearken unto the voice of God, a people that would listen to God, Amen. causing people to walk in his ways, keeping men from falling, Amen. and making men a partaker of the divine nature. God is able to do all these things and much more by Jesus Christ. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all we ask or think, according to the power that he worketh in us, unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. It's a lofty, that's a lofty thing that God's able to do. I'd say it's worthy of all our thought and consideration even. Men are the object lesson to showcase the ability of God to principalities and powers in heavenly places. <clears throat> The most notable work and largest exhibit or display of the ability of God is not to create, but to save a fallen creation to the uttermost. It is through recreation or the new creature, not the creation, that the righteousness and grace of God are actually made manifest. Praise God. We can see, we can, but we see Jesus. Now, faith is the persuasion or your conviction upon the ability of God. Do you, like, is God able or not? If you say yes, then that's faith. If you say no, that's unbelief. Faith is what connects a person to the ability of God and to God himself. Unbelief is what disconnects you with God's work and ability. Faith is able to persuade you that God is able it is the hand of the new man reaching out and laying hold on the promises of God. 
Faith is what enables the new creature to hear the word of God, digest it, and then put it into action. Amen. Believing in God is what causes men to live a life that is God-centered and trust in God's ability to provide for all their need. God's ability is connected to his person and character, and only those who have life from God are correctly able to reason upon his ability and live. It's good to know, it's good to know like some things that God are able to do. Maybe if you want to make a list of things that God is able to do, things that he's done before. I'm saying it's far greater to know the God who is able. I'm, it's, it's, it's far greater to have eternal life and know God and know that God is able. God is the one who is in control and works what he desires. Therefore, it's only God who is the one who is able to prophesy. He knows the end from the beginning. Men can only guess. And the surety and the foundation of the work of God is established upon the truth that the Lord is able to perform that which he has promised. God's ability extends as far as and only as far as his purpose. What he has promised, he's also able to perform. So you can be certain that every time you read the statement from, from the Lord in the scripture, I will, it will at some point be followed up with the phrase, and it came to pass. Every single I will of the scripture is eventually going to be a, and it came to pass. I'm looking forward to all those, and it came to pass. Faith in God himself which is how the Bible talks about faith. That's Men talk about faith in terms of faith in self or faith in humanity, but when the, when the scriptures talk about faith, it's talking about faith in God. Yes. Faith in God is the only thing that enables a person to correctly and righteously reason upon the ability of God in the diverse trials of life. And trials, brethren, are diverse. There's going to be things that arise that are not directly addressed in the, in the word of God. And I'm going to say faith is what's going to bring you through that. Amen. This includes, as I said, the diverse trials includes areas where there's not a historical precedence from the Lord. There's not a maybe thus saith the Lord on the matter. As you can reason with Abraham, who staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God and being fully persuaded that what God had promised, he was able to perform. I'd like to conclude with the fact that not only is God able, but God is able, he's also, he has the ability to make you able. God, he's the great enabler. <clears throat> Through the exceeding great and precious promises, we are partakers of the divine nature. And part of God's nature is that he is able. Therefore, God's ability and attributes are like written into the DNA of the new man. There, you just tap into those things by faith and you'll find that you're able to overcome the world. <clears throat> There's not one promise that God has made that he will not give grace to fulfill. Amen. Not as if we are born again and then sent on our way. Or as the scripture would say, not as we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything is of ourselves, but our sufficiency of, is of God, who hath also made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. Amen. God is the great enabler, enabling men who were once alienated from the life of God and walking in darkness to be in light, to walk in the light and have fellowship in the light with God, and even be involved in turning men who are darkness, turning, turning them from darkness to light and from the dominion of Satan unto God. I have found no greater work to become personally involved in than the ministry of reconciliation. And there is no better co-worker in this work than that of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit which is dwelling in us. The God of all grace 
is able to make grace abound towards you. <clears throat> and we know that grace is the, that's the divine enabler. Grace makes you do something. Grace isn't a, it's not a, it's really not just a covering. That's not what grace is. That's mercy. That's, mercy's a covering. Mercy's like, you know, uh, forgiving you for something that you, but grace enables you. The grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous for good works. Grace is able to make you do something. Say no. And look and, and wait on the Lord. Now God, he is able to multiply in the land of affliction. He's, he's, he's able to make you able and adequate. He can cause adverse circumstances to be exceedingly fruitful. And he can cause even an imprisonment to be a time of great liberty to write the things of God. As Paul would write to Timothy, For the which cause I suffer, I also suffer these things. Nevertheless... I am not ashamed. That is, in the end, this thing is going to work out for my good. <clears throat> I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. So, brethren, the good news is that the Lord is not losing any treasure that's in heaven. If, so if you, if you lay up for yourselves some treasure there, you can be assured that it's going to be there when you get there. Now the Lord is able to provide for his body, and, but often he does so by means of the body of Christ. He, he provides for the body through the body, through, to, through the ministration of the body. He makes brethren able to supply the need of other brethren. So the needy saints in Jerusalem had their needs supplied by the brethren in Macedonia. God gave to Macedonia what was needful in Jerusalem. So whether it be money for needy saints or precious truth to sustain poor souls, the source can always be traced back to God and his grace. The Father of lights, who gives every good and perfect gift. God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that ye, having all sufficiency in all things, may abound unto every good work. Now the thing about grace, though, brethren, is that you, you have to require grace to receive grace that he, he there's no storehouse of it. It, it god's got the storehouse but you don't get a storehouse i don't get a storehouse you get grace when you need it Amen. so i i suggest that that i suggest that it's time to start doing a work that that requires the grace of god you want to make sure that whatever you're doing for the lord requires his grace And God's, God's grace is not a short supply, brethren. <clears throat> God is able to make you adequate to stand before him. You're able to stand adequate and accepted before the righteous and holy God of heaven. Amen. And if really, at the end of the day, if you cannot stand accepted before God, what exactly are we doing here? that we, we can just go home. If, if, we're not, if at the end of the day we're not going to be accepted by God, we, I've just wasted a lot of gas driving over here and spent a lot of time that I didn't really need to spend. But, however, <laughs> God is able. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God and our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both, ne both now and forever. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> and then again, in Romans, Who art thou to judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. Yea, and he shall be holden up, for God is able to make him stand. Amen. How exactly do we know that God is able to make him stand? How do, you, how do you know that God is able to make you stand? Because you're standing, brethren. 
if you're believing and standing, it's because God's able to make you stand. I know because he's made me able to stand. When, when once I wasn't able to stand, he has picked me up and set my feet on a solid place. He's able to make you stand. Well, I know that our, our world today is very trendy, and success seems to be measured by how many new things people can come up with. Every week, it seems like there's a new plan for godly living. Um, and However, faith is not trendy, and truth doesn't need an update. The righteousness of God is not the result of a step-by-step -step program. And if you have found yourself trusting in any other than God through Christ by the Spirit, right now is the time to stop. You, you do not, don't, don't leave here trusting in anybody else other than God. Don't, don't, don't do it. Don't go. Find yourself trusting in God now and forever. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. He's able to keep you, brethren. I'll see you there.